If you don't have a Bible this morning, hold up your hand and our ushers would be glad to get one to you. And let's all go to Romans 16th chapter. Romans 16. Can you take some more preaching this morning? I already gave you a sermon and a half. But you know, we, we don't want you to go away hungry. Here, we want you to have more than enough. Uh, we've been on this topic for some weeks now when we haven't been doing special things. <laughs> More than one person told me I didn't go long enough last Sunday again. <laughs> it's nice to hear that once in a while. <laughs> but uh, no, it's a special day, right? right. And... Uh, I think, like we said before, I think it went well. <laughs> Romans, the 16th chapter, and the, toward the end of the last chapter of Romans, there's a statement, a phrase, Romans 16, 26. He said, Now is made manifest... And by the scriptures of the prophets, according to the commandment of the everlasting God, made known to all nations for the obedience of faith. Everybody said out loud. The obedience of faith. Hmm. The obedience of faith. Uh, how many were here Friday night? Let me see. Did you get anything out of that Friday night? Amen. I'm telling you, the Lord helped us Friday night. Uh, I would, uh, I feel prompted to instruct you just a little bit about ministry because I'm, I'm praying myself and, and believing God for the next phase of ministry. I'm, I taught from a different place part of the time Friday night. Um, there are different anointings and different ways of, of doing the same thing. If you've you know, noticed in 1 Corinthians 12, he talks about different kinds of ministries, but the same Lord, different manifestations, but the same Spirit, different operations, same God. And... Uh, there is te uh, the teacher's anointing where one teaches with revelation a subject. And your, your emphasis is the, the bringing out the light on that subject. Everybody say subject. And that is a God-ordained and a wonderful ministry. But there's also the teaching ministry through the anointing of a prophet and or an apostle. And it's different. It is teaching, but it's different. And uh, I've operated in uh, the teaching operation prophetically uh, numerous times in the past, and I believe that should happen more. I believe that's part of my transition. And... Uh, the Lord has blessed us and allowed us for five years now to lay foundation, right? Lay foundation. Get subjects covered, right? Start on them and stay on them for weeks and, and get a grounding in a subject. And we've done quite a bit of that. And then there have been times, though, the, the teaching ministry uh, with the prophet's anointing is not just on the subject. It is, how, how do you say it? It's like spots. Spots. It, it deals specifically with issues people are dealing with at the moment. Hmm? And, and a lot of that was happening Friday night. There was here... And then here, and then here, very pointed, very specific. 
direction and revelation. And I, I don't really know all the reason why I'm telling you this, but I felt like I should. To understand, do you understand just the concept different anointings? Different levels of, uh, I mean, uh, have you ever heard, you know, I, I, when I first got to school at Ramah, I know I heard Brother Hagin sometimes he'd get up and read a whole chapter before he'd start preaching. Sometimes he'd read a half a chapter, a whole chapter, more. And I was just amazed at the revelation I got when he read. He wasn't even commenting on it yet. He'd just reading it. But see, what was the thing? He was reading it with the prophet's anointing. Well, there's, it's stronger, and there's more revelation in it. People get hung up on titles and miss the whole deal. Well, are you a this? Or are you a that? Don't even get. Don't even go down there. I mean, you know, it's it's like a, a bush in the winter time saying, "I'm a pear tree. I'm a pear tree," and got no leaves and and got no fruit. And say, "Well, how do we know you're a pear tree? You don't have to say anything." Just wait till fruit bearing season, and if there's pears on the tree, you don't have to put a sign on it saying what it is. Everybody knows it's a pear tree. So don't get hung up on putting titles on yourself, on anybody else, because that's not really what matters anyway. It's fruit. I said it's fruit, and fruit is when somebody's benefiting. But uh, how many would agree with me? Let's have the higher levels and the highest levels yeah. of anointing. And, and through, through me, through Phyllis, through whoever else would be speaking, through our special guest speakers, right? That they would minister on the highest levels of anointing that God's used them, right? And then come up to even higher places. So something to think about, something to understand, something to, uh, to pray about. And to believe for. Back to our text, Romans 16. It says, the obedience of faith. Now, we've been on this subject for some time. The obedience of faith. And we said that they're connected, faith and obedience. No, no real way to separate them. And yet, when you talk about having faith, so many times people have not thought obeying God. And yet, if you believe God, you obey God. Amen. Your faith and my faith is demonstrated, revealed by our obedience. You know, you could tell me. If I said, you know, would you do this? And you say, well, Brother Keith, I, I believe you. I trust you. I got confidence in you. Uh, well, so go ahead and do it. Well, Brother Keith, I believe in you. <laughs> I, I trust you. I got faith in you, man. Okay, so do it. Ah, Brother Keith. <laughs> well, you ain't got to keep saying that. As long as you keep saying it and don't do it, what do I know? You don't. How could I know you really believed it? You do it. Right? You do it. So that's what the, you, you find this more than one place, the obedience of faith. Now turn with me please to, to John, Gospel account of John, and the 14th chapter, and I would ask you to, to use your faith with me this morning, believe with me, there's some uh, extremely important things, some, some precious things that I sense in my spirit, I'm going to use my faith, but utterance is greatly affected by the hearer, you don't give uh, pearls to pigs. What does that mean? What, what does that mean? You don't give precious things to people who don't value them. You're foolish if you do. And so, uh, you know, one of the things the Lord's been doing in us is growing us up quickly. One of the parts of growing us up is us learning what's valuable and what's not. What's precious and what is unimportant. And uh, when the Lord gives you something, you know, how many know you can give a child something, uh, you give a little one a $20,000 watch, and they just liable to slap it up against the sidewalk, right? right? Why? And laugh while they do it. 
Why would they do that? They, they have no concept of the value of it. Well, then you're foolish if you give it to them. Hmm? Well, God's not foolish. And how would you know if you could give them something nicer? Huh? By how they're treating the last thing you gave them. Isn't that right? How would the Lord know he can give us more? He can give us more revelation. Well, did we just yawn over the last revelation he gave us? <laughs> huh? Did, you, did we just go, man, I want some fried chicken. That's what I want. I, I don't want to hear another verse. Fried chicken. <laughs> well, you're immature. Right? And, and, you know, the Lord's not going to give you or me something more precious, and we're not valuing what he's just gave us. Oh, but when he gives us something precious and we go, oh, glory to God, oh, thank you, Master. And we remember it tomorrow and the next day, and we do everything we know to keep hold of it and, and to put it into practice, he's going to give you more and bigger and greater. Can you say amen? John 14. John 14. There is a statement the Lord gave me for you and for us when I was in Seattle, wherever, how many days it was ago, praying. And he reminded me of this series that we're on. And uh, this, I wrote it down. Well, actually, I had a little recorder, and I recorded it. The level of commitment shows the degree of love. Well, I, I, I said it backwards. The first statement was this. There is no love without commitment. And the level of commitment shows, reveals the level of love. Say that out loud, that first part. Uh, there, is no love there is no love without commitment. Without commitment. Say that again. There is no love without commitment. One more time. There is no love without commitment. Say it again. There is no love Without commitment. Now, every teenager in the place, every teenager in the place, are you listening? I hope you're listening. I might embarrass you if you don't. Teenagers, teenagers, front and center, stand up on your feet. Every teenager in the place, stand up on your feet. Every teenager, please, stand up on your feet right now. Say it out loud where I can hear you. There is no love. Without commitment. without commitment. That's weak. Say it again with me. There is no love, is no love. Without, commitment. without commitment. Say it again. There is no love without commitment. Say it one more time. I want to hear you say it. There is no love without commitment. Do you think that's true? You can be seated. I'm going to demonstrate it to you from the scriptures. It is so vital that you understand this because uh, the devil will lie to you. He lies to everybody, but he has been particularly successful lying to young people and people with lack of experience about love. Love is one of the most abused words, Mo one of the most twisted, confused concepts that people have about the most precious thing in time and eternity. Love is not a feeling. Love is a person. God is love. God's not lust. 
God is love. God is not just want and need. God is love. Real love is God. Now, there is nothing more important. I, I received a directive from the Lord when we started this church. He told me three main things to teach the church. And the first one was how to love him and each other. We, we know it. We all nod when we hear it. But I don't think we've realized how important this is to him. This is the New Testament commandment. Of all the things he could have told us, this is it. Faith is not more important than this. This is more important. Right? Than anything. Then everything, loving him and loving each other is the most important thing we do in this life. I'm, I'm, I'm getting stirred in my spirit about it. I'm believing for revelation. How many have a desire to know what real love is? What, what do you say when you said that? What did you just say? Who God is, right? Who God, what God is. How many have a real desire to know how, from God's perspective, how to love each other and to do it and to know you're doing it. I'm believing for revelation. I'm believing for revelation. I'm believing for light. I have a directive. We, we've taught on it. You know it. We've taught on it more than once, but we're not done by any stretch. He, he directed me to teach on faith also. And second thing, and third thing, how to be led by the Spirit. And so we've done that. We're going to do it some more. But the greatest of these is love, right? Love is not a feeling. Love is a person. And there is no real love without commitment. In this, in this world uh, you know, ungodly world that we live in, you hear love used with everything, right? I love pizza. I love my car. I love this. I love that. I, you know, uh, and, and people talk about, uh, do you believe in love at first sight? And, uh, you know, what was a popular song? Was it one of the Beatles songs? Hello, I love you. Won't you tell me your name? <laughs> was that a Beatles song? <laughs> what was it? Did I get it wrong? Okay. Hello, I love you. Won't you tell me your name? <laughs> well, I'm sorry, but no, you don't love them. Well, yeah, I could. You don't even know them. You don't know them, and you've never proven any commitment to them. And what was the statement? Without commitment, there is no real love, no true love. Now, uh, John 14, are you there? The words of Jesus. We got red words here. Huh? Some of your Bibles got red words? Do they mean anything to you? These are precious to us. John 14 and 15. 14 and 15. What did he say? What did Jesus say? Huh? It's up on the screen in big letters. Tell me what it says. Who's talking? Who's talking? Jesus is talking. If he was right here and you could see him instead of me, would he tell you anything any different from this? Would he look at you and say that very thing right there? What would he say? Imagine Jesus looking at you right now. And he says, if you love me, you'll keep my commandments. Is that true? Well, what if you disobey him and ignore him and hadn't got time for him, but you love him. <laughs> I, I, I love him. Lord, you know I love you. 
I mean, I, I know I don't ever do what you want me to do, but in my heart, you know I love you. Even though I haven't obeyed you, you know that inside, I, I love you. No, he doesn't know that. No, he doesn't know that. And we got to get that clear with each other. People go, well, you know, I, I know I hadn't been there for you. And I know that, you know, it's always been one-sided. And, but you, you know I love you. No, if there's no commitment... There's no love. Now see, this will, will shine the light on, on the world's falseness concerning, you know, it, 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 we're at huge numbers of people who are living together and not marrying. Right? We are at huge numbers of people being married a brief time and divorcing and then divorcing again and then divorcing again and then divorcing again. But people say, well, what does it matter? It's just a piece of paper. We're married in the eyes of the Lord. Well, what is your problem with standing up in front of God and people and committing to each other? Why would you be hesitant about that? Why? Well, see, that's the problem. People don't want to commit. They, they, they want to you know, enjoy what they can, but they want to keep one foot out the door in case I want to leave. I want it to be easy. It's kind of like parking your car in backwards so that if you need to get away real quick, you can just <laughs> go jump in, you know. So that's one reason bikers back their bikes into the, in case it gets rough in the bar, you can get out and get gone quick, you know. Well, people, people go into relationships that way. They're like, they're like, yeah, let's back in here in case we need to. No, I'm not going all the way in. No, no. And if the commitment isn't there, tell me what else is not there. Love isn't there. Love isn't there. And the pressure that people, men and women, put on each other young people and older people, to have sex outside of marriage. And, well, we're going to be married. Well, how many people that were going to be married never were, you know? Well, we're, we're going to be, well, what, no, unless the commitment is there, you're calling it love, but it's not love. You wanting something is not you loving them. Them wanting you is not them loving you. When people say, I love you, I need you, I love you, I've got to have you, I love you, I can't live without you. That has nothing to do with loving you. Right. Nothing. That's right. They, I love you, I need you, means I love what you do for me. I love how you make me feel. And of course, when you quit doing it for them, then they don't love you anymore. When the thrill is gone, <laughs> yeah, so are they. <laughs> are y'all with me this morning? Have you got time for this? Someone says, well, yeah, I know with people I've had my ups and downs, but now with God, I love God. I love God with all my heart, all my soul, all my mind and my strength. Why didn't you show up uh, for that thing you volunteered for? Oh, well, uh, I don't know. I had other stuff, but I love the Lord. Uh-huh. He said otherwise. Huh? If he dealt with you to do something and you don't do it, even though you don't want to hear it, and I might not want to hear it, the truth is you loved something else more than you loved him. Why 
isn't this place packed this morning? Why don't we have people in the lobby and people outside trying to hear? And every church that way. Why? Why? Because people love something else more than they love God. They love partying. They love sleeping in. Huh? They, they love something else. And they, and they don't like, oh, no, no, I love God. I love God. I just, I just like to do it my own way between me and the Lord. And I really feel closer to God in nature than I do in a crowd of people. And I don't care what you think, preacher. That's the way I, you know, God, God understands me. Uh-uh. <laughs> uh-uh. No, he told you and me and every believer not to forsake the assembling of ourselves together. He told us what to do. He told us to come together and to get together and to encourage each other. And no matter what you feel about it, if you loved him, you would do what he told you to do. Simple. Now you can play games and you can pretend that you can do all of that kind of stuff. But bottom line is, put, put the scripture back up. What did Jesus say? We just got through reading it. What did he say? If you love me, what? Keep my commandments. If you love me, do this. We're talking about the obedience of faith. Uh, Skip down to verse 21. He that has my commandments and keeps them He it is that loves me. And he that loves me shall be loved of my Father, and I will love him and will manifest myself to him. Oh, glory to God. This is the revelation of one of the greatest mysteries on the planet. Why is it that some people, God is real to them? And others, they're asking, is there a God? Hmm? And we live on the same planet. There's millions of people who are agnostics and atheists. There is no God. And, and, and to them, they got no proof to their satisfaction of God. God's, what, what is God? I don't know God. What are you talking about? Y'all are praying in the air. Who are y'all talking to? But here's the thing. God has set it up this way. Do you understand if God wanted to, he could shake this planet in the next five minutes and there wouldn't be an unbeliever on the planet. I'm talking about that didn't believe in God. He could show up. He could put his face in the sky a thousand miles wide and say, I am God. And there wouldn't be anybody asking the question, is God real? Somebody said, why don't he do that? He doesn't want to. Because right. hmm? it would take it out of the realm, then, of real faith and real love. In order to have real faith and real love, you've got to have a real choice. You've got to be able to choose whether you believe or you don't, whether you'll obey or whether you won't, whether you're committed to him or whether you're not. And this is a very short thing from his perspective, very, very brief. And now is being proven who are worthy to be with him personally for eternity and who are not. And who are the ones that he retains with him? The ones that believed in him when they couldn't see him. The ones that believed in him and loved him when they couldn't feel him. The ones that were committed to him when nobody was making them. Oh, do you see this? The ones who loved him when they could have done something else, but they were committed to him. And they did what he said, even though they couldn't see him. And they couldn't feel him. And they proved it over their short life on the earth. These are the ones that make up his jewels, that rule and reign with him 
for they proved their faithfulness. They've proven it. Keep reading. He that has my commandments and keeps them, he it is that loves me. He that loves me will be loved of my Father. How would we know we loved him? We do what he says. And the Father will love us. And I will love him and will manifest myself to him. The people who believe in him enough and love him enough to do what he tells them to do, he makes himself real to these people. Amen. Not to the doubters. The people that don't believe in him get further from him. And they have, they, he gets less and less distinct and real to them. But the people who believe in him and love him and obey him and love him and obey him and love him, he makes himself more and more real. How many know God can be so real to you, more real than any human person that you know? He can be as real to you as the breath that you breathe, the chair that you're sitting on. Somebody says, I want God to be more real to me. Simple. Believe in him. Love him. Obey him. And he will become more real to you. Yes. Doubt him, question him, rebel against him, and he will become less real to you. He said, I'll manifest myself to him. If Jesus said it, he'll do it. Judah said to him, uh, not Iscariot, Lord, how is it that you're going to manifest yourself to us and not to the world? He's trying to figure that out. What we were talking about before. If God puts his face in the sky and says, I'm God. He says, how, how are you going to manifest yourself to us? Won't other people see it? Won't other people know it? No. Keep reading. How's he going to do it? Oh, this is exciting, friends. This, do you sense this or not? How many would like the presence of God to be more real to you than the clothes you have on you right now. I mean, I'm telling you, God can fill up your house. He can fill up your car. He can. He can, he can become so real in your life that, that you are aware of his thoughts. You're aware of, of, of his spirit. Everything you do all through your day and all through your night. Would you like for him to be more real to you than he is right now? This is how, right here, this is how. Read the next word. What does it say? Because he's, he's asking him, how are you going to do it, Lord? How are you going to do that? And we're going to see you and know you. are going to be very real to us, but other people are not. How's that going to happen? How are you going to do that? He said, Jesus said, if a man loves me, he will keep my words. And my Father will love him. And we will come unto him and make our abode with him. Glory to God. Glory to God. How do we know you love God? You obey him. Right? What if you don't obey God? But you keep affirming, I know I don't obey him, but I love him. No, sorry. You love something else more you you wished you did but you don't go with me to second timothy please have you got a few more minutes yeah. not quite through i need i need to get through need to get through for a quit and then i need to quit when i get through <laughs> second timothy Hallelujah. Glory to God. Do you see the level of abuse that there is with this word love in the world? That's why we've talked to you a while back. If you remember, we said, don't, don't say, I love this, I love that. Don't use the word loosely. God is love, right? Let, let's focus and learn what it means and, and say it properly. And not just say it, but do it. Manifest it 
in the actions. I, I, I moved a little bit too quick on this. Uh, go to 1 John. Then we'll go to 2 Timothy. 1 John. And the third chapter. First John 3 and 16. First John 3, 16. Hereby perceive we the love of God. Here we, we see what love is. He laid down his life for us. God so loved the world that what? He didn't tell us how he felt about us. Hmm? He didn't just yell from heaven, I love you. How did he demonstrate and express his love? He gave his only begotten son, and the son obeyed the master, did it. He laid down his life for us. And because of that, we ought to, to lay down our lives for the brethren. Say it out loud. Commitment. commitment. Cost you. Cost you. Commitment costs you. Yes. It's going to cost you something yes. to keep your commitment. People need you when they need you. Yes, not when it's convenient for you. Right. In fact, you'll, you'll notice it. Many times, it's not convenient. I've never had the Lord ask me when he dealt with me to give something or to do something for somebody. Never once did he preface it with, with Keith, is this a good time? <laughs> is this a good time for me to get you to do this? Is this a good time for me to get you to give that money? It's a, because again and again, it wasn't a good time. Yeah. You matter what I'm talking about? It, it wasn't. I had other stuff going on for the money, other stuff going on for my time, and it just wasn't a good time, I thought. But if I love God, now I'm up against it. I got to make up, you know, if I love God, then uh, I know uh, one time there was some kind of some friction between some ministries and uh, some people had said some things to me that really wasn't right. And um, it annoyed me. And uh, they did some things that it wasn't their place. They didn't have a right to, but they were, you know, doing it anyway. And the Lord dealt with me. He said, I want you to apologize to them. I thought, huh? <laughs> what? <laughs> For what? <laughs> For what? I said what you told me to say. I, I, did, I, I thought I did what you told me to do. He said, uh, do you suppose you could have done it with more grace and wisdom and faith and love? I said, yeah. <laughs> I probably, I'm sure I could have done it better, smoother. And you know, a lot of times that makes it more palatable. People receive it better. I still wasn't keen on the idea. I thought, Lord, <laughs> you know, they were wrong. I mean, they, they were really. And then, then he said this. He said, uh, he said, if you don't diffuse this, other people are going to find out about it, and they're going to take sides. And people are going to take sides with you against them. And it's going to be a rift. And feelings will be hurt. And fellowship will be broken. And you have the opportunity to defuse this and stop it right now before it gets started. Amen. Then he said this. He said, Keith, would you do it for me? <laughs> Man, it's over. I mean, right? I'm already getting out the paper. I mean, I'm, I'm going to write the letter. I'm going to make the call. Yeah, yeah. Would you do it for me? Now, that should put a completely different complexion on anything in our lives if the Lord says, would you do it for me? Because he's asking you, would you forgive them for me? Would you love them for me? Maybe they don't deserve it. Maybe they don't, you know, 
hadn't done it right and you don't feel like that but would you do it for me well if I love him what's going to happen I'm going to do it no matter how I feel about it no matter what's going through my mind or my thinking if I love him I'm going to do it God's talking to people right now hmm said out loud Lord I love you more than anything more than my own life I love you more than what I feel, more than what I think I need. I love you, and I know the way to show it is to obey you. Amen. To obey you. There is no real love without commitment. Now, that's another way of saying what we read in the Scripture. How many understand when the Lord tells you to do something and you followed through and did it because you said you would do it, that's commitment, right? And that's, what, that's why marriages that could make it are not making it in churches and in countries because there's not the commitment, right? People are in it as long as it's fun. Well, the commitment will hold you when it's not fun. The commitment will hold you. Oh, I'm so glad Phyllis and I didn't bail. We could have quit. We could have quit on our marriage. Years ago, there were several uh, opportune times we had. Either one of us could have. You've heard us talk about it. We, we had some very unpleasant times. Hellish times. But I'm so glad we didn't quit. There were times she and I both wanted to quit. But thank God we were committed enough to the Lord that we came and fell across the bed and said privately, Lord, you know I want to quit. He said, no. <laughs> well, But you, you got to do what the Lord said. He said, Father, if there's any other way, let this cup pass from me. Did he want to do it? No. no. But what did he go on and say? Nevertheless, not my will, but your will. How many understand you don't have to write books or try to go into great explanations. This is all the proof anybody would ever need throughout eternity how much Jesus loves the Father. Amen. Right? It's proven. It's done. When he, he marched right on out of there to the trial and to the scourging, he went right on to the cross and he hung there when he could have called on angels and got delivered off of it. He didn't. He stayed there. Why? He loved the Father and he loved you. More than his own feelings. Commitment. He saw it through. The Bible said he, he endured the cross, suffering the shame. Why? For the joy that was in front of him. Somebody say commitment. commitment. Say it again, commitment. commitment. We're, we're living in a world that have to look it up in Webster's and still wouldn't know what it means. Commitment. Aren't we? People have no commitment to their family. They have no commitment to their job to their church they got no commitment it's only what's in it for me and when you preach like this I know I preached on love uh, you know for a couple of weeks one time another place years ago and the lady came at the end of the time she said I am so glad you're preaching on this I've been telling people they're not loving me like they're supposed to <laughs> and I'm going to get them these tapes I've been telling them you're not loving me. I said, sister, you missed the whole thing. <laughs> well, she didn't enjoy that, but she needed to hear it. <laughs> Listen to this now. If you are continually thinking about how others are not loving you, you are not loving them. Did you hear me? That's not my theory. That's Romans 2. Romans 2 says, when you judge another, you are guilty of the same thing. 
Y'all are too quiet. Go to Romans. I'm trying to find a place to finish. Can you stay with me, though? Can you help me? Huh? It's not just about quitting. I could just say quit. Bye. Let's go. But let, let's, get to the, let's get to the place. Hmm? Say it out loud. I love God. I believe in God, and I love God, so I obey God. I'm committed. Romans 2, it says, verse 1, Therefore you are inexcusable, O man, Whoever you are that judges. Now let's just stop right here. What if, what if you're thinking or even telling others, they don't love me. They don't love me. They haven't committed. You know, like, like Brother Keith preached last Sunday, if they loved me, they'd do this. They'd do that. Well, you're judging them. Right? Keep reading. For wherein you judgest another, you condemn yourself. For you that judges do the same things. Now man, this, this will help us in all areas of life. The, if you really were doing better than them, you wouldn't judge them. Because you'd know how you yourself were tempted. And how you almost yielded or in times past yielded and didn't do everything you should have done. If you really had overcome it, you knew what it took to overcome it. If you really were doing better than them, you'd know it's only by the grace of God that you are. But when you judge them and go, you're not doing this and you're not doing this and you're not doing that. I've sat across the, the, the desk from married couples. And if I've heard it once, I've heard it dozens of times. And we'll say, well, you're not, you're not doing this for me, and, and you're not giving me what I need, and, and you don't give time to me, and you don't, you don't talk to me, and, and you don't share. And they say, well, you don't do this with me, and, and you don't respect me, and you don't help me. What are both of them saying? Hmm? Give me. I need. Give me. And they say, well, I need too. I have needs too. Well, you're not loving me. And they say, well, you're not loving me. It's obvious when you judge them that they're not loving you, it's obvious you're not loving them. Right. Oh, come on. Can you see this now? Yes. When you are judging them, they're not doing this, you are guilty of the same thing. Yes. Romans 2, 1 right. says so. Yes. It's not your job no. to talk them into loving you. God told them to love you. He didn't tell you to tell them to love you. <laughs> what did he tell you? He told you to love them. Yeah, but what if they don't love me? He still told you to love them. Right? Yeah, but what if they ain't loving me like they're supposed to? He still told you to love them, not judge them for not loving you. Hmm? And what if everybody on the planet decided they're going to love everybody else whether they love them or not? Jesus had come. <laughs> this thing would wind up. We'd all be in heaven this evening. And it's why he said this is the commandment. Not a suggestion. This is the commandment. I am commanding you. You love each other just like I have loved you. Gee, I mean, the Father could have set up in heaven and said, y'all don't love me. <laughs> Couldn't he? You prove it every day. You don't love me. You don't love me. I made you. I created you. I give you your next breath. I keep your planet spinning. I keep the sun shining. And you still, you don't love me. You don't love me. You don't appreciate me. You don't love me. But if he'd have done that, he'd have been guilty of not loving us. Of course, he didn't do that. What did he do? Even when we were still his enemies, not loving him, he loved us. Oh, glory to God. That's why we love him, because he first loved 
us. He loved us and proved it by his commitment to us. His commitment to the covenants from the Old Testament all the way through the New. Never gave up on us. Kept on believing we'd come around. Jesus committed unto death. He has proven his love. You know, it's really insulting when the ignorant folk look up and go, well, do you love me? God, where are you? If you love me, he has got nothing to prove. In his loving us, he has proven it. It's in blood. It is not the question. And so if somebody's doing it, God, do you love me? What do we know? They don't love him. That's the issue. How would we know if they loved him? They'd do what he said. I don't know what he said. Get a book. Get a Bible. <laughs> get a Bible and just read it and do it. It'll keep you busy from now on. Yeah. Right? <laughs> can you say amen? amen? Second Timothy. Let me see if I can close. Second Timothy. Say it out loud again. There is no love, is no love without, commitment. without commitment. The reason I had you to stand up a few minutes ago, young people, all the adults know why, is that you'll be lied to about love, what love is. And uh, when people say, I love you, I want something from you. It's not true. I said it's not true. I love you, but I can't make any commitments. It's not true. There is no love without commitment. And you know who the people are that really love you? Thank God for this family God has given us. Because there have been evidences of real love. Anybody in here know what I'm talking about? I know you do. Huh? How do you know there's some people around here that love you? Huh? They are committed to you. Right? They are there for you. They will be there in the middle of the night, early in the morning. They'll spend their money. Right? They will stay and they will stick as long as it takes. They don't have to tell you every other day they love you. You're seeing it. Right? It's good to say it, but saying it without doing it is empty and hollow. Hallelujah. I think you can see this is really big, can't you? Second Timothy 4. I think I can close, though, and maybe the Lord give us more on this later. No maybe about it. I'm believing for it. Second Timothy. We're going to grow in, in love. Amen. We're going to develop in it. We've already seen some good evidence of it. We've made progress. Second Timothy. Fourth chapter. Second Timothy 4. And verse 9, he's telling Timothy to come to him. 2 Timothy 4, 9, do your diligence to come shortly to me, for Demas has forsaken me. Who would quit Paul? Now see, we, we like to think, well, you know, I haven't been faithful to these people because they're so carnal and they're so, you know, I just can't find anybody spiritual enough that I'm willing to submit to. There are a lot of folk like this. Well, if I could find somebody worthy, you know. Demas decided Paul wasn't worthy. Judas decided Jesus wasn't worthy. Hmm? They didn't know who they were with. 
Oh, come on. Do you see this? Jesus' own family didn't know who was in their house. Did they? His own mom. His own brothers and sisters stood outside the door and said, the boy's lost his mind. We got to take him home. He don't even know what he's doing. And Judas sold him out. He, he's not aware this is the king of kings and lord of lords. He's looking at a man whose feet gets dirty, just like his does. Huh? Who needs to sleep just like he does? Who gets hungry just like him? And people judged him after the flesh. People did the same thing with Paul. They did the same thing with Peter. They've done the same thing with others throughout history. Because God's using people that's just like you. Right? Flesh and blood. And so you got people that go through their whole life and miss such amazing, wonderful opportunities waiting on somebody that's superhuman and in their romantic, goofy idea, amazing enough for me to submit to. Well, what does that make you? Who are you? <laughs> have, you have you heard all the people that go, don't go to church? Because they can't find one spiritual enough for them or that's perfect enough for them. And they, well, there's hypocrites over there and they don't do this the way I think. And I just, I haven't found one that fits me. What are you looking for? Besides that, who said you, you could choose where you wanted to go? People look at you like you slapped it when you say that. Well, this is America, preacher. This is our home of the free. I'm free to go wherever I want to go. No, you are not. If Jesus is your Lord, you're supposed to go where he tells you to go. And stay unless and until he tells you to go somewhere else. And we got most of the church world don't even know that. Don't even act like that. If he's your Lord, you do what he says. Not just what you say. If you love him, do what he says. You obey him. Where are you? Demas forsook Paul. How many think it would be the greatest honor and privilege to serve with Paul? Do you? Hmm? What if the Lord had prompted you and said, I want you to help Paul. You lived with him. I want you to help Paul. What would it have been like? Now, I've heard people go, oh, God. No, it wouldn't have been like that. It would have been long voyages on boats. It would have been ducking out of town late at night. It would have been dodging rocks. It would have been seeing who could come get you out of jail. There would have been some ooh glory, but there would have been a whole lot of this other stuff. Hmm? And you'd have still felt the same way when you got up in the morning. Your flesh would have still been there just like it is right now, right here. Hmm? It's tempted the same. People have romantic notions. Demas worked with Paul, was part of his staff, was part of his preaching team, and he left him. Why? Read the rest of it. Why? Well, no way somebody heard Paul's preaching and decided they loved something else more. Yeah, they did. How about somebody that sat at Jesus' feet? Rubbed shoulders with him for years, years. Saw miracles right under his hand. Saw blind eyes open and deaf ears and the dead raised. No way you could do that and then walk away and leave them. Judas did, right? Demas did. Why did he do it? He loved this present world 
How, how many of you could say more than God? More than right? Because if it will love God more than that, I've had uh, people ask me about, you know, for instance, we're talking to the teenagers a minute ago, and, and, and we don't need to play games about this. I mean, when you're young, your hormones are raging. Man, you're tempted. What, what is going to enable a young man or a young woman to keep their body and not defile it with people that don't care about them? What, what's strong enough for them to control their own strong physical urges? There's only one thing. You've got to love something else more. Oh, come on, do you understand this? You know, to, people sit up in church and they act like nobody's tempted. The preachers preach like they're never tempted to do anything wrong. And the people sit up in church and act like they're not. We know better. We know better. You got flesh. You got eyes. You got ears. You got a mind. And you are tempted. Things pull on you. Amen. Amen. All of us, we live in this world. Here's a man, worked with Paul, sat under his teaching, saw the miracles. And he decided he loves the world. He loves that more. So he left him. What would keep you steady? What would keep you committed? Through the long ship trips, <laughs> the jail visits, the, what, what would help you get through that? I've had people say, boy, y'all must have really loved, uh, you know, Brother Hagin to stay with him as long as you did and go all the places and do all your things. Well, we, we did and do. But that wasn't what kept us. Because there are times it takes more than that. <laughs> I don't care who it is, how wonderful they are, their time, and you know that with marriage. I don't care how, you, how wonderful they are, there are times it takes more than that. What does it take? We jumped up when we didn't feel like it. We stayed late and got up early and spent our own money and do why? Not just because we love them, because we loved God and He told us help them. Yes. Oh, come on, can you yes. see this? So we're we're not doing all this just because we love them. We love God. Yes. And that's strong enough to overcome the urges of your flesh and the temptations and when you feel weak and, and when you're tired, that love which God is yes. in you yes. is God strong. Amen. It's strong enough to keep you and help you to be able to say no to your flesh and Amen. control yourself and, and stay committed. Amen. 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 How can you keep from falling? where other teenagers have, everybody else is doing it. How can you keep from doing it? Because you know your body wants to. How can you? Only one way, only one way. You love something else, somebody else more. And even though you want to do it, he told you not to. So out of love for him, you don't. And out of faith in him, you believe you're not going to miss out anyway. Hallelujah. Hallelujah. He's going to take care of you. Right time in the right way. Amen. Hmm? Amen. You're not going to miss a thing. You can trust him. Demas left him. Having loved this present world. Somebody say not me. Not me. Not me. Not me. I can resist temptation. I can, resist temptation. I can, overcome, weakness. I can overcome weakness. And weariness. Because I love something else more. I love somebody else more. I love God more than what I want. Stand up. Everybody stand up. Say it out loud again. I love God more than what I think I need. I love God more than what my flesh desires. I love God. So I'm committed to God. I love people. So I'm committed to them. 
I love God. So I obey God. Lift up your hands. Begin to thank God. Begin to praise Him. Hallelujah. Hallelujah. Yes, Lord, yes. Oh, thank you, Lord. Oh. Say yes, Lord, yes, to your will and to your way. good, isn't it? Did his spirit speak to you? Let me encourage, I'm going to encourage myself too. Listen, keep it, stay committed. Amen. Stay committed. Hallelujah. Let's take some time just thank him. Thank him. Thank you, Lord. Thank you for your goodness in showing us your love for us. Thank you for your goodness in teaching us, Lord, helping us, Lord, giving us direction on how we can change our lives and change the lives of others around us through your love. Through your love. Thank you, Lord. Thank you, Lord. Be seated for just a moment. Praise you, Lord. Father, I pray for all those sitting in this auditorium, watching by TV and Internet. They've never made Jesus Christ Lord of their life. They've never experienced that love that you have for them. Lord, I pray for them today that you would draw them mightily by your Spirit. Help them to know that you love them, that you, that you sent your Son and he died for them, and they can be yours. Lord, I also pray for those that maybe walked away, have not been living for you, had, had went against the commitment they'd made for you, got off into some other things, Help them to know that you still love them. It can be just as good as it ever was if they'll just come back to you. Pray it in Jesus' name. Friend, if I'm praying for you today, you're in this auditorium, you're watching my TV or Internet, and you've never made Jesus Christ Lord of your life, there'll never be a better day than today to do it. If you'd like me to pray with you, just, just raise your hand and say, Brother Dave, I've never made Jesus Christ Lord of my life. Raise your hand, let me know, and we'll pray with you today. Or maybe you were the one that walked away. You, you've not been living the way you ought to have been living. You haven't been doing the things you ought to have been doing. Raise your hand, and we'll pray with you. Thank you, Lord. Thank you, Lord. Thank you, Lord. All right, let's, do, let's stand up together then. Thank you, Lord. Let's affirm our faith together in case there's somebody out there that does want to affirm their faith today. Amen? Amen. Pray this with me. Father God, I believe in you. I believe in your love. I believe in your son Jesus. That he died on the cross. That he rose again. That he paid the full price for all my sins 
Jesus, you are my Lord. You are my Savior. I will serve you as you help me all the days of my life. Amen. Amen. Friend, if you prayed that prayer today and you've never prayed it before, or if you came back to God today, as people, they're going to sing as we're leaving, but as, as, as everyone else is leaving, there's going to be people along the front here. If you have any question about your salvation, any questions, anybody wants somebody to pray with you, talk to, come down and see them. Don't walk out. Come down. Let us rejoice with you that you've returned to the Lord, that you've made him the Lord of your life for the first time. We want to rejoice with you. Amen? Amen. The word of the Lord was good today. Amen? We're receiving, receiving. Everybody receiving with me? Praise God. Man, it was good. Well, they're going to sing, and we're going to be dismissed. We love y'all. I say yes, Lord, yes, to your will and to your way. I say yes, Lord, yes, I will trust you and obey. When your spirit speaks to me with my Just me.